Hi, everybody. It's Jessica Stone at Stansbury Research, and I'm joined now by Amanda Kowochi of the Health and Wealth Bulletin. And Amanda, we're getting some new research, you tell me, uh, about fatalities with COVID. What do we know? Because not everybody dies or even becomes very severely ill from this illness, so it's confusing for people. I looked up what the current case fatality rate is. Now, case fatality rate is the number of deaths divided by the number of confirmed COVID cases. Now, worldwide right now, it's about 4%. The U.S. is a little less than that. It's about 3.6. But here's the thing. It's actually more likely to be much, much lower than that. Uh, And the reason for that is all the unreported cases. Um, Back in May, Dr. David Ifrig actually wrote about this in Retirement Millionaire. There was a paper that came out that said for every one person who tests positive, there's probably at least 10 people who are positive that have not been tested. Mm. Um, And right now, actually, this morning, I just got the headline from Stat News that that can actually be as much as 24 times higher. I believe that's from a paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So some areas in the U.S., it's 24 times higher. That's that drops the case fatality rate much, much lower. So it's likely very much lower than what we're seeing in that 4 percent for the world. So obviously, we've seen the president this week have a big about face on his guidance. Uh, He's taking a softer tone with public advice about mask wearing, about the trajectory of the virus and the length of of time that it's going to take to recover. Um, But at the same time, I think there's a lot of people who want to know, and I know you said one subscriber in particular contacted you to find out what we know about long-term medical effects, because we are sporadically hearing these reports where people don't shake the virus um, for months on end or where they have some sort of neurological or or physical impact that stays with them long after the main symptoms of fever and coughing subside. Although most people are recovering, you know, within a few weeks, we do have these folks who are going longer, they have longer problems. Um, I know right now there's actually a study in the works it's called the COVID-19 Observational Study, and it's, uh, the acronym is Red Coral. If you want to look that up, it's actually pretty neat. And what they're doing is they're actually looking at people who were hospitalized, uh, who got out, I think it's from March until June. So they're looking at a very big cohort of people, and they're going to be following them to see what those long-term effects are. Right now, we already know that there are problems with things like lung injury. Um, there's also you know, cardiac problems, uh, people having arrhythmias and cardiomyopathy, um, which is where your heart doesn't beat as well, so you're not pumping blood as effectively. Um, That can be really scary, and it can be a lot of really long-term problems. I mean, people might have this for years. Um, One of the things I did see was that uh, in, I believe it was in the SARS pandemic a number of years ago. We've gotten some good clues from, right, studying that. Absolutely. Um, There was some question about um, diabetes onset because the SARS virus at that time they thought was attacking certain cells in the pancreas that kind of work with your insulin and all that kind of stuff to keep your blood sugar normal. Unfortunately, some of those people recovered quickly and some didn't. Some people had to battle, you know, new onset diabetes for for years. Um, And we are starting to see that possibly with COVID-19. We're not quite sure where that's going to land us, but that's something else that we need to start paying attention to. I want to ask you about this term that we're starting to see being written about in the mainstream press, um, long haulers. These are people who describe themselves as having the disease for months on end, symptoms coming in and out over the course of months. And it seems to be impacting, you know, sort of, um, workers that are maybe in their 30s or 40s. These are not people with a lot of comorbidities or with a lot of age uh, sensitive factors. Long haulers, you know, they're still being studied. I know with other respiratory illnesses, sometimes you do have symptoms that last for a very, very long time. Uh, For instance, it's pretty common if you have pneumonia that you'll have a cough for months and months and months after. I mean, I, I know some people, it seems like they've been coughing half the year after they get over pneumonia. There is still a lot we don't know. Um, But what we we do know, and you kind of mentioned this with the implications for the healthcare system, you know, hospitals are taking on a lot of COVID patients, but unfortunately, hospitals are not in great shape right now. Um, And that's not just because of overwork in certain areas. I'm talking about a lot of hospitals are actually filing for bankruptcy. Um, That's because they've had to cancel other procedures. I mean, everything that brings in the big money, like, you know, elective procedures, elective surgeries, that kind of thing. Um, So they've let staff go. They've let 
you know, their revenue has been shrinking. Um, I actually just saw a chart from our senior analyst, Matt Weinshank, who uh, sent it over and it's this year we have double the number of bankruptcies in the healthcare sector than we saw in 2019. And it's actually a new record for the, as long as they've been tracking it. I think that's a Bloomberg article if you can look it up. Um, so you're telling me all of this is happening at a time when our medical system is less and less equipped to even take, you know, if I stub my toe, there's not, there may not be somebody who wants to or can take a look at it just because the office might not be open. Right. I mean, and that's why we're seeing a growth in telehealth visits. A lot of people are doing it online, but sometimes you still need in-person care. And so that's going to be uh, challenging. 60% of cardiologists are 55 and older. And this was a couple of years ago when the survey was done. So they're going to be aging into retirement and there's not enough people to fill that in. And if we're going to see these long-term effects from COVID, that's something to really be concerned about because we may not have enough cardiologists for all the heart problems that we're going to be seeing. And if you would like to see much more content just like this, especially this intersection of health and wealth investing, you can find Amanda Kowochi and the rest of her colleagues uh, by, by subscribing uh, to their product. You can just hover on the subscribe icon at the type of your screen to find it. You can also find us on YouTube. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.